And that was Philip Wesley's Come Thou Found. And now uh, I'm going to spring forward here. This is the Spring Tide of Hope. Change levers here. This is by Shelley Fairplay. Backwards in my program a bit. And just for fun. Okay. Okay. I play a lion and healy prelude lever 40 hertz, so I'm changing the notes with the levers on the top.
Tease of the Toccata and Fugue in D minor by Bach. And we will close with a little bit of Kathleen. Uh, Kim, just a word of warning, it's about two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Oh, maybe I should do the fairy dance then for the in Celtic terms for the. Sounds great. I'm oh, sorry, let me get my numbers. Okay, got it. That was really wonderful. <laughs> do a happy All Hallows Eve as well. Uh, for before I see you the next. Oh, and the solar eclipse tomorrow. Right. <laughs> well, thanks again, Kim. It was lovely as always. Uh, we really oh, appreciate thank you, you so playing. much for having me. And uh, and and I hope at least you're going to be able to see the partial eclipse. You should oh, be from California. I, I, and and the, I, I'm at Orange. Coast College and uh, our planet at our planetarium there. We all, I bought goggles for everybody. Ah, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, everybody, welcome to the October meeting for Orange County Astronomers. We're really delighted to have you here, and um, I'm actually greeting you virtually from New Mexico, thanks to the miracle of uh, of modern uh, ways that we can do meetings. Um, and uh, uh, Charlie also is uh, present uh, um, from a different location in New Mexico. Um, and uh, Alan is here with me. We're all here for the eclipse. And I hope wherever you are, you have, uh, if you're within the, uh, the range of seeing at least a partial eclipse, that you have an opportunity to do that. Um, anyway, we have a great program tonight. Uh, before I turn it over to our uh, wonderful announcement crew, um, let me uh, remind you that we are in the midst of our very own election season, and uh, we are taking nominations this month and next month. Um, they end at the end of the November meeting. Uh, so if you are interested in running for a position on the board, uh, please send your information, uh, email it to Alan Smallbone. Um, at, he is our club secretary, and he will be uh, keeping records of everybody who wants to run and coming up with the final um, uh, ballot um, at after the November meeting. Um, I'm sure there'll be a slide about that as well in the announcements, but it doesn't hurt to let people know more than once. Anyway, um, I, we, we welcome any of you who want to join in on the election. Um, it has uh, really been a rare privilege for me to join, uh, to serve on the board. Um, we have wonderful members on the board. Um, and uh, it's it's always good to have new people join now and then. Um, uh, actually, pretty regularly would be a good idea. Anyway, uh, without any more ado, let me turn it over to Kyle Graham, who will be giving us the announcements for the month. Hello. All right. Here we go. All right, so welcome new members. Uh, you can either pick up your uh, name badges if you're in person on the whiteboard, depending on when you, you joined, uh, you'll either, they'll either be there this month or next month. Uh, otherwise, if you're not able to attend the next couple of meetings, they will be mailed to you. 
star parties. Uh, the next ANZA star party is tomorrow. Uh, Astrophysics special interest group will meet October 20th. Uh, the beginners class November 3rd. And the next board meeting is November 5th. Uh, for more information about all the events, please check the Orange County Astronomers website. And on the calendar, there will be more information about each event. Uh, outreach program is currently on hold. Uh, you can still email the uh, email address uh, if you have any questions or inquiries about that. Uh, the coffee stand is open up by the library entrance. Uh, coffee, donuts, war. Um, feel free to grab a snack uh, throughout the meeting. The uh, adopt a scope program is up and running. You can find more information on our website, including a sample adoption agreement and a current inventory list. And there's more information on the website, as you see there under the resources tab, and then adopt a scope. You can find all this information there. If you have any items of interest that you think would be uh, interesting to be put in the newsletter, uh, please contact Dave Fisher at the email there, newsletter at ocastronomers.org. Uh, items that you know we're looking for that would be interesting, uh, articles, images, observations, club news, trip reports, equipment for sale, et cetera. Uh, any of those things you have that you'd like to put in there, please contact Dave Fisher and he will review those. Again, for newsletter delivery preferences, uh, everyone has mailed a copy of the newsletter uh, unless you opt out. If you would like to opt out and just receive it online, please uh, email Charlie at the email there. Again, everyone receives a printed copy unless you opt out and everyone always has electronic access through the website. A uh, reminder about weed clearing at ANSA, make sure to keep your patent observatory areas clear of weeds. And then uh, as always, help is always appreciated throughout the common areas, including the ANSA house, football field, Coon Observatory, et cetera. Uh, thank you very much about that. Um, again, Barbara mentioned about the uh, upcoming leadership elections. Uh, here's just some of the uh, guidelines about how the election process works and uh, the qualifications necessary if you are interested in running for any of the offices. Uh, if you're interested, uh, in Ryan, please contact any board member or email Alan at Alan at ocastronomers.org, and they can help you with that process. And uh, just a reminder, the nomination period closes at the end of the November meeting, which is next month. Upcoming events. Uh, as it was mentioned earlier, the Orange Coast College Planetarium is holding a solar eclipse viewing event. Uh, you can find more information at that link, uh, or you should be able to search it online. Uh, and it's on the uh, 14th tomorrow when the eclipse is. And then again, more information about the annual eclipse that's occurring tomorrow. Uh, you can see Southern California will get about 70% uh, coverage and you can see where the path is. Um, anyway, more information on NASA's website and it should be on most news outlets. All right, so I'll turn it over now to Chris Butler for the What's Up presentation. Thank you. Oh, we do not have any sound from Chris. Unmute. Am oh, I unmuted? Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah, sorry, we were kind of inspired. The uh, Chapman uh, Mime Cheer Squad is here this evening joining us. and. Uh, We'd like to thank them for their contribution. Um, all right, I'm going to push the button again. Tell you what, why don't I do...
Why don't I just come over and I'll push the little buttony thing on on the thingy? Okay. Yeah, one of those buttons. We're doing this old school, ladies and gentlemen. We've had all kinds of technical malfunctions. No, exactly. Me too. Uh, once we actually had a slide projector break in here, slide projector, no joke. And I drew on the chalkboard we used to have here a star chart. So we're prepared for anything. All right. Pushing the buttons. Pushing the buttons. <laughs> um rolling off well, <laughs> okay uh, yeah the excitement is building uh those of you at home please try to remain calm as uh as we go through here i'm going to try to roll the mouse we're rolling the mouse right left what do we oh dear lord Did... Let me switch. okay next picture please Look at that. Uh, what's going on with the sun right now? We talked about the defects the sun is soon going to have. Um, here's your uh, rise and set times. Okay, that's good. Uh, nights are getting longer now. That's good for astronomers. It's also good for the wonderful spooky holiday we have coming up here. Uh, next picture, please. Uh, we do have an annular eclipse of the sun coming up. Uh, the, the reason, even though the moon will be from some parts of the United States uh, centered, on the disk of the sun. Uh, the reason it's an annual, annular eclipse is the moon's a little bit farther away from the earth at the moment this happens, and it is not large enough to actually cover the entire face of the sun. So that gives us this weird uh, ring of fire that allows the news media to freak out. Um, this is always good for uh, scaring the uninitiated. Um, yeah, any opportunity to make some serious money on this. Uh, let's let's try the next picture. Let's see what happens. Okay. Um, here we go uh, from Griffith Observatory up there uh, where I work. Uh, there's, there's, this is your chart to give you an impression of what's going to happen. Uh, we're going to have the eclipse start just a little bit after 8 a.m. as the sun is rising. 924, according to Griffith, is the maximum of the eclipse. Uh, what? So I can just go out and look at it like that? Uh, well, actually, I'm going to have some details detailed instructions that our legal department brought forward to me, uh, occupational self and, uh, you know, his safety and all the rest of this. So we, we will have that. Um, 924 looks like maximum eclipse. We're going to get it. Oh, totally. The, the sun will be back to normal at 1050 AM. However, you just thank God you don't work at the Griffith Observatory like I do, because every nut in the Los Angeles basin will be on top of the hill to join us. Uh, banging pots and pans and certain that the world is ending. But that's not odd. I've been on eclipses where people, the whole town set off fireworks. Well, no, this is true. I mean, since ancient times and, uh, and animal sacrifices, uh, but who knows? Uh, I, I'll be up at the office tomorrow. Animal sac sacrifices possible. Next picture, please. Um, looking at the eclipses, we've already seen the track for the uh eclipse we're going to have tomorrow uh, that's the one to the left of your screen for this annularity that's the path where you can see the ring of fire it doesn't include us in los angeles but interestingly we have the big eclipse coming up next year in april and that's the other track that you see when the moon will be closer to the uh, earth at that time larger in apparent size and therefore able to completely block out the sun in a genuine total solar eclipse this is going to be a big one an important one um, in april and you have to be under that uh, gray zone diagonally across the u.s from roughly texas up to, to you know canada Am I going to go? Yeah, actually, I am. I found some cousins on Facebook. Um, we, we, well, cousins in the sense that our families were linked about 1300 AD, but I'm calling them cousins. And the reason I'm doing this is they have a beautiful home on a lake in the path of totality. So as far as I'm concerned, they're my cousins now. Okay. I mean, their 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 name is Schmichtelberger, you know. Uh, it's not Butler, but we figure we're we're all hey, we're all related. If you go back to uh, East Africa at some point, we're just gonna take a plane to Mazatlan and sit by the pool. Well, we'll be thinking about you while we're roasting in Texas. Uh, but do notice the paths cross in Texas, so there will be some localities in the south part of Texas that get both. Yeah, right around San Antonio where they get both eclipses. Uh, next picture, please. Um, for those of you who do not have 
uh, the safety pair of uh, glasses, the very important ones. This is when the legal department comes in uh, for the benefit of the camera. There are special ones that you can get at places like Griffith Observatory. Uh, these will probably protect your eyes, although not in a legally binding sense, but it's recommended you wear these. Um, or if you have a telescope that has a special solar filter, of course, you can watch this. Uh, but if you don't and you'd like to see the shape of the sun, uh, you can create a pinhole projector, as you see here, uh, just using a piece of paper or cardboard or something with a small pin hole in it, uh, it will actually project an image of the sun during this. This is a safe way to view the eclipse. Uh, there are alternatives if you would like. Uh, there are uh, some optical, other alternative optical designs for viewing the eclipse. And I'd like to share one of them with you now that doesn't focus on a wall or a piece of paper. Next picture, please. Um, this is what we call a pinhead projector. And the pinhead projector focuses all the light of the eclipse on your retina. Uh, and it forms a very lasting impression of the eclipse. In fact, you might see it for years and years and years. Uh, this is not the preferred way to do this. And I wanted to warn you again, this is the legal department. If you don't have the glasses, do not lower your glass. You know, don't look at it. And if you have the glasses, use them. Uh, if not, you, uh, you can see this slide is sponsored by the Braille Institute and you will be seeing them or rather visiting them, but not so much seeing them as such in the future. Don't look at the sun. Next picture, please. Um, as far as moon phases right now, kind of interesting in October, we have three primary phases of the moon this month. October 21st is the half-lit moon in the evening sky. October 28th, celebrating my birthday with the full moon, ladies and gentlemen, isn't that a big deal? Um, but you'll notice we didn't have a fourth phase this month. It, it can line up this way, where the uh, 29 uh, cycle phase of the moon, we just did not happen to actually have one of the primary phases occur uh, for last quarter during this month. And it's interesting and unusual. Next picture, please. As far as the planets, Mercury and Mars are very close to the sun right now. They're not well placed for observation at this time. If you're a big Mercury fan, I draw your attention to the uh, first week, roughly, uh, last week of November, first week of December. It'll be available in the evening sky. Venus, should you get up in the morning? I don't know why you would, but if you do, it's up at 319 in the morning and is quite high and brilliant in the morning skies pre-dawn. Jupiter is also very bright in the morning. Uh, it's uh, just a little bit dimmer than Venus. Uh, it's going to be at its highest or transiting at 2.06 a.m. It's very well placed. Jupiter is a great object. It's up by 7.24 p.m. So up just pretty much all night long. Um, Saturn is an earlier in the evening object right now. Uh, we'll show you uh, pictures where it is on a chart in just a moment. Uh, Uranus is also beautifully placed right now. If you would like to hunt it down, you need a telescope, but you can hunt it down. Um, or yes, binoculars, or yes, at least one club member who claims to have superhuman vision can detect it with their eye. Uh, but really, for most of us, it means a telescope. Neptune, definitely a telescope uh, at its highest 11 o'clock in the evening. And then apropos of our main speaker, uh, Pluto, you can see uh, just barely, you could catch it at the absolute beginning of the evening, uh, but it'll be on its way down just shortly after the sky gets fully dark. Uh, really put it there more just in honor of tonight's uh, lecture. Next picture, please. I do want to mention that Saturn, uh, the ring, uh, the angle of the rings does change over the years. Right now, 2023, you can see the rings are still open 24 hours a day. Um, it's just like it's just like norms, really is. Um, 2024, they're going to be a little bit narrower, uh, and in 2025, we'll have uh, the rings edge on. They'll actually be hard to see, and a few times uh, we'll be at exact edge on and won't be able to see the rings. So uh, keep an eye on that change. Next picture, please. Uh, Neptune, don't count on a lot from Neptune. Please do not be angry and ask for your money back. Uh, we're lucky to be able to see it. It's just a little faint smudge in your telescope. 
Uh, next picture, please. Uh, Jupiter, uh, definitely not a faint smudge in your telescope. Uh, you can see the cloud bands on it, and you can see its four largest moons, even in binoculars. So if you see where Jupiter is on the charts, seriously, a good pair of binoculars, have a look, you'll see the moons around Jupiter. It's a good first experience for many people uh, just getting into the hobby. Next picture, please. Um, as for uh, Uranus, um, it... Now, this is maybe a little bit larger than most people see it. You require an optical aid to see it. And this is actually a very, very good picture of Uranus. Um, but it's a, just a little green fuzzy thing. And again, you, that's not something you want your doctor to be seeing. Next picture, please. Oh, one back. There we go. This is the chart for the beginning of the evening, 8 p.m. Um, you can see there Pluto is at its highest here. The sun is set. It's just getting dark. Pluto will soon be moving into the west and setting. So you got to catch it early. Uh, Saturn is already up, uh, as, is, as are Neptune and Jupiter, but they're not very high. Let's give them a little while longer. I do, uh, for stargazing, uh, direct your attention to straight overhead, which is in the middle of the chart. Right. Oh, look at that. Wow. It's almost by magic. Uh, the stars Dana, Vega and Altair marking the summer triangle. These are some great constellations to have a look at. Next picture, please. Oh, look at that. Uh, and there they are helpfully uh, labeled. Uh, it's easy to recognize stars like Vega because they have the word Vega next to them and a white arrow pointing toward them. This is very helpful. Um, these are actually in three separate constellations, and they're wonderful things to look at all, in all of them. Next picture, please. Um, the Cygnus, the Swan, is one of my absolute favorite constellations. It's one corner of the Summer Triangle. Um, and as an example, at this early evening object, uh, Alberio is a good example. Again, this is a beginner object for a fairly small telescope even. Absolutely gorgeous. I know we have a UCLA contingent in the room, uh, and I direct to them the fact that the blue and gold are represented here by blue and gold stars right next to one another. This is one of the most beautiful beautiful uh, double stars in the whole sky, and it marks the absolute end of this cross shape. In fact, the nose of Cygnus the Swan is marked by this star, so it's a pretty easy one to find. I recommend this. Next picture, please. Um, this goes back to uh, the square of Pegasus, which is op uh, the highest just about oh, 10, 1030, something like that in the evening. Um, the square of Pegasus marking the body of the horse um, it's a little hard to, to make out the uh, winged horse flying across here because, first of all, the horse is upside down with uh, south being up for the horse. So his neck is down. He has two legs there off to your right, marked by fairly faint stars. He doesn't have any wings. He doesn't have any back legs. He doesn't have a tail. Uh, but otherwise, it's a dead ringer for an upside down wingless legless flying horse. Um, Still, if you remember the big square, you can find all kinds of things there. Uh, I am thinking about a friend of mine who is, in fact, in the room. Uh, she has noted that my favorite name for my favorite favorite object there, the beautiful globular star cluster M15 in Pegasus, uh, was the boogers. And the reason I call it the boogers is uh, there you see the arrow that marking that out. It's right off the star Enif that marks the nose of the horse. So this has been ejected forcibly from the nasal cavities of this mythical beast. Um, one thing about that, by the way, for all of you, I did research whether or not there are in in fact, uh, photographs on Google of horse boogers. And the fact is there are, and they were so horrifying, even the what's up guy would not put them in the lecture. So if you want to find out what horse boogers look like, that's up to you folks. It won't be as pretty as the beautiful star cluster there. Next picture, please. Jumping forward in time, the coffee is hit. You're unable to sleep. You're jittery. You don't like being around other people. You talk incessantly. I understand. That's what midnight is like for an astronomer. And if you're up at that hour, the sky looks like this. You can see over to the right, the summer triangle has moved into the west and is setting. But you see the planets we've been talking about have risen now to be at their highest. So stay up till midnight. So you can see Saturn. Uh, Saturn is visible down in the uh, southwest a little bit. Uh, we've got Neptune down there. You want to hunt that with the telescope. Uh, Jupiter is brilliant over there. Uh, you can have a look at that. And very close to it, Uranus. We're very careful how we say that.
Um, there are other constellations just above the square of Pegasus. You can see it just about the center, a little bit higher. There are the constellations of Andromeda and Cassiopeia. We'll have a quick look in those for you later night, people. Next picture, please. As for Andromeda, uh, these little chains of stars uh, are supposed to rep represent uh, a young lady chained to the rocks and not wearing very much. Um, this was before television, and they really had to use their imagination. Somehow they made it look like that to them. Um, it's a little chain of stars, but it is it is a distinctive shape. Um, the star Alberio we talked about earlier, the end star in this chain of stars, Almach, is marked on the chart for you there. And you can see the picture over to screen left. It is another blue and gold US uh, UCLA star as well. Very similar, actually, to Alberio. Very pretty. A lot of people miss it uh, as the years go by because uh, Alberio is so famous. Do remember remember to stop by Almach and have a look. Uh, the star attraction, so to speak, is the big red blob, which is M31, the Andromeda galaxy. We'll have a picture, of course, of that in just a moment. Next picture, please. Um, there it is, uh, the great next door neighbor uh, galaxy in Andromeda, visible even in a pair of binoculars, and certainly even to the naked eye if you're in a dark location, or if we have an earthquake and the power grid in Los Angeles fails. Uh, of course, you all recognize the next picture, uh, which was also of the Andromeda galaxy. Next picture, please. This is, of course, where you've seen it before. Uh, this, this is a long exposure photograph taken from inside the medical frigate. Um, next picture, please. Um, this is the blue snowball in Andromeda in the northwest part of the constellation, NGC 7662. Uh, it is a so-called planetary nebula, gas cloud blown off by a dying star. It is not a planet or related to a planet, except you saw the pictures of Uranus. You're try still trying to wash that out of your eyes now, knowing what it really is like. But um, proctologist or not, the uh, little blue green fuzzy thing, uh, these look like that. So to uh, mid 18th century astronomers, they named these planetary nebulae because they did look a little bit like the new planets Uranus and especially Uranus that had just been discovered. Next picture, please. Uh, the big W shape of Cassiopeia is immediately above Andromeda in the sky far in the north. Very distinctive pattern. One of my favorite constellations, which is known especially for its star clusters, M52. One of these is shown on the screen left. Next picture, please. Uh, this is a picture of the entire constellation, an actual photograph showing all the zillions of faint stars here, and also the dark dust clouds, which are often, uh, they can be glimpsed, actually, out in a dark sky sight, these clouds of dust floating out there in space. Next picture, please. Uh, this NGC 281 is a nebula in Cassiopeia, as captured in a photograph. Uh, one warning, people say it's the Pac-Man nebula. However, there are very few people alive today who remember Pac-Man. Um, I won't describe what video games were back then, but they had this red blobby nebula thing that used to eat little dots. I'm just kidding. Um, but they, they think that this kind of looks like Pac-Man. So that's its nickname, the Pac-Man Nebula in Cassiopeia. Next picture, please. Uh, if you do stay up till 5 a.m., the sun's about to come up, the coffee still hasn't worn out, all of your friends have gone home, and like Linus, you are still out there in the most sincere of pumpkin patches. Um, but you've pretty much blown your shot with Sally. She's on to you by this point. Um, I recommend you console yourself with the fact that Venus has risen in the West. Brilliant object, brightest thing in the sky, except for the sun and moon. And this brilliant object will be your last thing for the What's Up this evening. Next picture, please. Um, looks a bit like this right now in your telescope. It is white. It is as bland as a ping pong ball. There are no craters. There are no details. There are no shadows. But you will see all kinds of things on this object. You will imagine you see clouds, lightning, Venusians, all kinds of things, because you paid $10,000 for that telescope. And by God, you're going to see something on Venus. Um, the fact is it's covered in white clouds, but it is very bright. It is a spectacular end to your evening. Uh, I hope that's a good idea of a few things to look at. And with that, it leaves me only to say one last thing, which is, next picture, please, 
Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful, happy Halloween. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris, for yet another wonderful and cheerful, uh, full of jokes uh, presentation. Uh, although a little bit naughty, huh? So uh, I would like to welcome everybody uh, again uh, to the um, to the October 13th uh, General Meeting of Orange County Astronomers just before the uh, night nationwide eclipse tomorrow. Uh, my name is Reza and I'm the current vice president. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me go ahead into introducing our speaker tonight who's joining us from Arizona Flagstaff. Uh, he's the historian at the Lowell Observatory, uh, where he has worked for 28 years and is an active member of the Flagstaff history and science communities. He has written more than 600 magazine and newspaper articles on subjects ranging from local history and astronomy to baseball and the Lincoln Memorial, and contributes a bi-weekly astronomy column, View from Mars, for the Arizona Daily Sun newspaper. He has written seven books, including Historic Tales of Flagstaff. And a fun fact about him is that he has both a fossil crab and asteroid named after him. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Schindler. Kevin. Thanks, Reza, and thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, can you hear me okay? A thumbs up? Yes. Thumb okay, great. Um, well, it's really great to see everybody um, virtually, if not in person. And I think we're all excited for tomorrow. And uh, wherever you are in the morning, it's going to be a really fun time. Here at Lowell Observatory, we we pre-sold 1,300 tickets um, to our event, and then we had to cut it off because we don't, we have parking for well fewer than that. <laughs> but we're going to get a lot of people just coming up the hill, also walking up the hill. So it's going to be a great event. We're ho I'm hosting a live stream tomorrow morning um, that will be. Um, tuned into our telescopes, and we get about 85% coverage here in Flagstaff. And then we're also going to be connecting with um, Sunspot Solar Observatory, as well as an individual astronomer um, in the Albuquerque area who's going to, he's right in the path of annularity. So, I, you know, I think we're all going to have a great time with it. We're all looking forward to it. And it's kind of the appetizer for next year. Um, good practice for the big show next year. Um, so it, it feels kind of funny to be talking about Pluto because so, the sun is and the eclipse is on our mind, but it, it really is fun for me to talk about Pluto in a story because um, I've worked here at Lowell Observatory for 28 years. And so many of the players involved with Pluto's search and discovery and consequent um, research, I've gotten to know. Family members are still around here um, or elsewhere. Um, certainly the Tombaugh family in New Mexico, they're good friends and come to visit us here at the observatory. Um, so for me to talk about Pluto, it's it's kind of like getting the family together and and telling the family story, it feels like. And it's really an honor for me to do this. Um, so a lot of you probably know the story of Pluto's discovery to some degree. You know, Clyde Tombaugh discovered it maybe and uh, Percival Lowell famously searched for a planet and died before he found anything, um, but that directly led to Pluto's discovery. Um, and there's certainly so much to talk about in Pluto, but I thought I would do a slightly different perspective tonight um, and kind of focus on two main characters that have to do with Pluto. And I, I think it's interesting, I'm going to share my screen here. I think it's interesting because um, they came from very different backgrounds. Um, and yet they had um, sort of the same goal in mind, um, same passion. Um, so those who I want to talk about, they're kind of going to be kind of intermingled here, are Percival Lowell and Clyde Tombaugh. Uh, Percival Lowell came from a very wealthy family. Um, just his, his generation, he was the oldest. And his brother, his younger brother, um, was president of Harvard for 24 years. One sister married a relative of Theodore Roosevelt. One sister married into the Putnam family, another blue blood family of the Boston area. And another sister won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, that's, that's pretty heady company, just that one generation. And, you know, it was driven into the Lowell family. Um, you don't rest on the laurels of the, of the name Lowell. You have to do something to enhance the name. 
And I think that's something that drove Percival Lowell. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with his um, study of Mars and the supposed canals that he thought were there and this fabulous um, story about Martian life that he came up with that we know is wrong, but it was so compelling um, that even today, when there's discussion about life on other worlds um, or water on other worlds, Percival Lowell's name always comes up because he built this consciousness of life out there. And like I said, he was wrong. There's no intelligent life on Mars, we know, but he, he made us think about it. Um, so, you know, he was really driven to make, you know, the name for the Lowell family. He wanted to prove there was life on Mars and he didn't do that. And, he, and then he got into searching for planets and he wasn't able to discover a planet. And I think he probably went to his grave unfulfilled because he didn't do that big thing that was expected from the family. And yet in hindsight, I think he was probably more successful than he ever imagined because he laid the groundwork for the search for a planet that we'll talk about tonight. Um, he, he established the observatory here in Flagstaff um, and, and there's so much research that's come out of here as well as public education. And so um, it's an interesting story. He was, you know, wealthy family, driven for success, um, passionate about astronomy. And then you have got the guy on the right, um, came from opposite means. The family had no money. They were on a farm in Illinois for a while, then in Kansas. He couldn't afford to go to college, um, but he was passionate about astronomy. And in fact, he learned all he could about Percival Lowell. And Percival Lowell was one of his heroes growing up. And um, they never met. In fact, Clyde Tombaugh died. I mean, uh, Percival Lowell died when Clyde Tombaugh would have been, I guess, um, uh, 10 years old, I guess. And so, um, but but their, their paths converged. And because of both of them, a planet was discovered. I mean, it wouldn't have happened without both of them. Um, not working together, but sort of, sort of cosmically working together, I guess. So this, let me talk a little bit more about Percival Lowell and why he started searching for a planet. He he famously um, grew up in in Boston, the fam in the Boston area, um, very wealthy family, and he went to Harvard because if you're a Lowell, you go to Harvard. Um, he studied mathematics, but his senior thesis in college was. Um, the about the evolution of planets and the and how they were formed, um, and but but it was just a passing interest of his. He he always liked astronomy, but he didn't see a career in it. Graduated from college, worked for the family business, textile mills, um, running the finances, and then he went overseas for ten years, and lived in Korea and Japan, and wrote several books based on these experiences. And in fact is still widely regarded as one of the um, first experts on oriental culture and religion. And, and in fact, today, if you go to some places he visited, um, for instance, a friend of mine who's on our um, a consultant here at Lowell Observatory, he went to a, one of the places where Percival Lowell visited, and we're talking about the 1880s and early 1890s. And, and my friend brought me back this package of cookies that has Percival Lowell's picture on the package because they still remember him there and regard him highly. So, you know, you wonder if he stayed in, in studying the Orient, um, would he have become like the person in that field? I don't know. But he did that for 10 years, came back to the United States and learned that the Italian astronomer who he was familiar with, Giovanni Schiaparelli, was losing his eyesight. And Schiaparelli had discovered these uh, linear features on Mars um, that he called Canali. And there were some astronomers around that thought, gosh, nothing in nature can, can be that straight. Um, it must be made by some sort of intelligent life. Um, and Percival Lowell really jumped onto this idea. He wasn't, he wasn't the first person to suggest that the, those features um, were were um, made by intelligent life. He wasn't the first to suggest there was life on Mars at all, but he sure was the loudest. Um, and he, and that's why even today he's talking about life in the universe, his name always pops up. 
because of that legacy he left. So he decided to study Mars. He, he, he had a lot of mathematics background and an interest in astronomy, but he didn't go to college for it. Um, but he decided to build his own observatory and set up shop in Flagstaff, Arizona, 18 years before Arizona was even a state. Um, so it was really kind of the Wild West. You had lumbermen and railroad men and, and astronomers rubbing shoulders. And he founded his observatory um, to search for this um, life on Mars. And then after a few years, he started searching um, for another planet. And the reason he started doing this, um, because well, I think partly because um, his ideas about life on Mars, he was getting panned uh, nosed in a, by a lot of astronomers who thought he it ranged from he doesn't know he's what he's talking about to he's a little cuckoo, um, something in the in between there, um, and I think I think in hindsight we can see that Percival Lowell was certainly very intelligent. He was an excellent observer, um, but his ideas there are a lot of assumptions in, in his ideas, and he told a good good tale. Um, and it sounds good, but but again, there's based on a lot of assumptions that we know just aren't true. So I think I think one of the reasons he started searching for a planet initially it was because he was um, studying the planets and trying to understand their their evolution, and and thought there were some issues there with um, there there might be another planet out there because of some things he observed. Um, astronomers have his time. Um, there are a couple others who thought there was another planet out there um, because because if we go back to 1781, that's when William Herschel discovered Uranus. And after his discovery, astronomers studied it and and noticed that it didn't seem to be moving in its orbit like it should for a planet of its size um, with its mass. And so mathematicians worked on this problem and mathematically calculated, OK, based on a planet this size, um, there must be another planet out there who's tugging on it, and this is where we think it is. And sure enough, in 1846, a couple different groups um, had the same solution and discovered Neptune. And and so um, as the years went on, some astronomers thought, gosh, that did, just didn't account for all those apparent irregular motions, those perturbations in Uranus's orbit. So there must be another planet out there. And that's where Percival Lowell entered the scene. Um, in 1902, he had, he had established his observatory in 1896, spent most, most of the early years on Mars. But by 1902, he was, he was really looking at the whole solar system and how planets are formed. Um, and, and in fact, kind of coined the term planetology for the evolution of planets. And um, he gave a series of lectures um, starting in 1902 um, this ticket you see here is is from one of his lectures a few years later, um, but but he was very popular speaker, very engaging. I I think of him as sort of a Carl Sagan of his time. He was just a compelling speaker that you're on the edge of your seat listening to, um, and so he gave these lectures. And in one of them, in 1902, um, he talked about why he thought there was another planet out there, just in passing, and then. The following year, he published this lecture um, in this little book called The Solar System. And, and again, just very briefly, he mentioned, um, he was talking about the meteor, meteor um, showers or, or uh, meteor streams, as he called them. And he, he said they, there seems to be associated um, with planets, like there's one for Mercury, one for Venus. And there is a meteor shower that, that there is no planet apparent planet in the neighborhood um, in the, with the same orbit. And so because of that, he figured there must be a planet out there. Here's the meteor stream. Um, there's got to be a planet that matches it. And then he also was looking at um, um, meteor showers themselves. And again, this idea that there must be a planet associated with them. He, he, he started working on this. So he, he just Mention it, 1902, 1903, but, by, but then by 1905, which was kind of at the height of his Mars research, um, that's when he started to begin searching for this theoretical planet. 
And in fact, for the next several years, um, he looked for it. And I would say it was a, it was a pretty quiet search. For somebody who um, really enjoyed being in the newspapers, and we have, we have old, old newspaper columns, um, books of them, where he gave lectures or was interviewed or wrote the story himself. Um, he, he really enjoyed being in the spotlight. Um, but in this case, he was pretty quiet about the search. Even his staff, not all of them really understood or knew what he was doing. He just sort of quietly started searching for a planet. Um, and um, that lasted a few years. So this is kind of a first phase of a search. Um, and in doing this, it was really, a, you know, a pecking thing, sort of thing, hunt and peck thing. Um, he first um, tried using a 24 inch refractor, the Clark telescope here. Um, and, and what he would do is, you know, he, he figured you're not gonna just look through a telescope and see the disk of a planet because somebody would have discovered it by them. What they're gonna do is look for um, essentially a, a change of a motion change um, by looking at pictures taken a few days apart. And so take a picture of the sky, and the pictures were maybe 15 degrees or so, the size of your fist at arm's length. Um, and then take a picture a few days later and you take these on um, photographic glass plates and then develop them. And initially what he did was superimpose them on each other and got a hand lens and, and looked at every dot. And when I say every dot, we're talking 100 to 200,000 dots um, on those plates and look for any of the change position, like if they're not exactly overlapping. And you can imagine how hard this would be and how inaccurate it is because if, you know, for instance, if the conditions one night are just a little bit hazy or um, the seeing isn't quite as good, the images aren't gonna overlap very as precisely as you need. There, you, you'll be able to tell where you are, but they're gonna be different images a little bit. So it was a very inefficient method. Um, he, he tried using the 24 inch refractor, but it's, it's um, field of view is so small and it magnified so much or, or you could see so many fainter stars um, well, well past 15th magnitude that it would take forever to do a search. He needed, he really needed a smaller telescope that took a wider field of view um, and he tried different ones. There's this, um, this telescope, um, the, he had a couple of five inch telescopes. He tried one of those, um, but none, none of them really worked very well. And it was sort of a half hearted search. Well, 1910, he started looking in earnest. And one of the reasons was because William Pickering, who kind of advised Percival Lowell when he was founding the observatory in Flagstaff, um, he was at Harvard College Observatory. His brother um, was, was the director, um, but William, thought there were planets out there. And he he predicted a flurry of different planets that were out there. And first of all, thought, you know, I, got, I have to start making it known that I'm looking for a planet. And I have to do this in earnest because he didn't want to get beat out. He didn't want William Pickering to discover this. Um, he's a lull. He has to make the discovery. And so he really um, kicked up the search effort. And this is starting in 1910 until the end of his life. And so um, he bumped it up in a few ways. Um, he continued to, to try different telescopes. Um, this is a 42 inch reflector um, called the Lamplin telescope. Um, it says 40 inch. Um, it was, the, the glass itself was 42 inches, but there were a couple inches that were covered by the, the um, cell holding it. Um, later on, they rebuilt the cell so there was another two inches. Um, they tried that telescope. They tried, kept trying different telescopes, but then they also got more efficient with um, searching the plates because the overlap with the eye with the hand lens is just not efficient. And so Carl Lamplin convinced Percival Lowell to get a Zeiss blink comparator. And with this, um, you can it's still going to be painfully boring <laughs> and difficult, but with this, you you mount a plate, one on each side. And right in the middle, there's an eyepiece you look through. And when you look through, there's a, there's a mirror. 
and it's a flip mirror. So you look at a small section of one plate, flip the mirror, and you look at the same small section of the other plate. And when you get pretty good at it, the flipping goes back and forth pretty fast. And so this allowed them to more efficiently review the plates and look for anything that moved. And it was still painful because all you're looking at are dots. Most everything are going to be dot or stars. You're looking for something has changed position. You know, two or three hundred thousand dots on here are going to be stars. Um, you know, things like stars that are so far away in a few days' time, their position relative to each other don't change much or enough to where you can notice it very easily. But something much closer, like a planet, um, is going to change position um, a lot faster on those plates. So you're looking at all these dots and looking for one that changes position from one day to another. And, you know, it could be an asteroid or it could be a piece of lint on one, but not the other. But there are a lot of times when he would he had to stop and measure um, planet suspects, but never did find one. Um, but this blink comparator did help the search. Um, they, they got another telescope they borrowed from Swarthmore um, College. And this was a nine inch telescope. And this was significant in hindsight because they took several pictures in the Gemini area of the sky um, in 1915, but didn't see a planet or anything. Um, the other significant thing, thing they did, if you remember the movie Hidden Figures um, featuring the computers, and those of you familiar with astronomy history know that Harvard College Observatory famously had computers who were people, mostly women, who made calculations. Well, Lowell Observatory had computers also. Um, the head computer, her name was Elizabeth Williams. And she was um, uh, purportedly the first female to graduate from MIT. She was brilliant. And she was in the Boston area. Percival Lowell became familiar with her and hired her to lead making calculations. So, so Lowell is going to look for a planet um, photographically by taking these plates and looking to see if there's any dots that change position. He's also going to do it mathematically by um, calculating the position where he thinks this new planet should be. Um, so there's two different methods. So the project is going pretty well. Percival is getting antsy. I mean, it's not unusual for him when he's not in Flagstaff to write a telegram or a letter. Um, in fact, in one case, he wrote a letter to, to the staff and said, um, don't be shy about sending me um, news of the discovery of the new planet. Uh, he was he was trying to will it. Um, didn't happen. But something that came out of it in 1915 is with all the mathematical searching, he thought he had a pretty good solution of where this theoretical planet would be based on the mathematics, the irregular motions of Uranus and Neptune and so on. So he published this memoir, Memoir on a Trans-Neptunian Planet. Um, and now, he, now that the mathematical search has told him where to look, now the photographic search will follow, look in that area, and hopefully, like they did with Neptune, we'll find a planet. Well, it all sounded good, but then Percival all died um, the following year. And with him went the search. Um, the observatory uh, was in a very um, bad place, a dark era for the observatory, because the founder who financed everything had passed away. Um, there were three full-time astronomers and a few other staff. Um, they were getting paid very little because the will that Percival left to support the observatory was contested. Um, his widow wanted the bigger piece of the pie because Percival Lowell left a lot of it for the continuation of the observatory to do research. And so that was tied up in court. And so there wasn't much money coming in. Um, there was Vesto Slipher who had was making the revolutionary observations of, rec of recessional velocity, the redshifts. Um, this was sort of the peak of his activity, um, but there just wasn't much money flowing. Um, and so projects like the search for the for a ninth planet, that was just done. Um, 
And so that, that seemed to be the end of the search. I um, mean, it would have been a footnote to history. Um, somebody else who searched for a planet but, but didn't find anything. And certainly there are other people who did that. So that could have been the end of the story. But then we, we have this other guy, this um, guy that first of all died in 1916. And just around that time, there is this little fellow right here. His name was Clyde Tomba. And he was going to school in Streeter, Illinois. The family lived on the farm there. Well, a few years later, um, they moved to Burdett, uh, Burdett, Kansas. I don't know, about an hour north of Dodge City. Um, well, little Clyde Tomba lived on the farm and he had an uncle who really liked astronomy and really got him interested in it. So much so that Clyde would go out at night, look at the stars. Um, he started going to the library and reading all he could about astronomy. And he was a, a voracious reader, so he liked history and other topics too, but really got interested in astronomy. Um, the family moves to, to Burdett, Kansas, and his interest in astronomy just gets stronger. His uncle um, loans him a telescope to look through, and it gets to the point where Clyde lives under these incredible skies. This is a picture of the Tombaugh farm I took a couple of years ago. Um, there's still some of the buildings there. Um, just incredible night sky. And so he got inspired to not just observe it, not just learn about it, but he wanted to build his own telescopes. And he built a telescope and he um, did the, the mirror himself and he tested it in the kitchen um, to see, you know, the focal test, the knife edge test, I mean, and um, thought he had a pretty good telescope and tried it out. And it was pretty lousy, actually. Um, it wasn't figured very well. It wasn't very accurate. And after talking to some experts, sending some letters, he um, found out that he needed a place where the air was more stable to do the knife edge, te knife edge test to really get a very precise curvature of the mirror. You know, in the kitchen, you have the windows open or people are coming in and out and the temperature fluctuations don't allow for that. He had to go a place where he had still air. So he convinced his dad that, you know, they live in a farm in Tornado Alley. We should have a storm cellar anyways. Um, convinced his dad to do this. So um, they, they did whatever they could to raise money to buy some cement. It became a neighborhood project and they built this, this cellar. And this, is a, this again, this is a picture I took just a couple of years ago. Um, here's the house, which has been abandoned for several years. And here's the storm cellar, um, which still stands. So the second telescope he built, the, the mirror he took um, down in the cellar and he was able to figure it very accurately, made the seven inch um, telescope and, um, and he, voila, he found success. Um, he gave this telescope to his uncle and decided to build another one. Um, he liked this telescope making thing. And he was a, you know, I think there's something interesting about him being a farmer. I, I think the same thing with, with um, astronomers like V.M. Slipher um, and his brother, in fact, and a lot of other astronomers who grew up on the farm. I think there's something you learn as a farmer that, you know, you, you learn that you work these long hours and you have to be really creative and a tinkerer because you're always tinkering with farm equipment to make it work. And the same with telescopes. I'm, you know, Clyde Tomba, I think, adapted some of his farming skills to astronomy and just kept tinkering and trying new things and just making it work. Um, so he wanted to build another telescope, um, but they had no money. It was, you know, these other telescopes he built, um, he used some parts around the farm. Well, he did the same thing with this third telescope. It was a nine inch um, reflector. And here's a picture of him in his telescope garden, as he called it, in Burbeck, Kansas. And a lot of you are probably familiar maybe with this picture, if not the telescope. You can't see just how unique this thing is. Um, again, remember he had no money. The family has no money. He can't afford to go to college. He's in his early twenties by this point. And so he doesn't let that stop him. Clyde Tomba is a quietly driven person. He loves astronomy. He's not gonna let 
a lack of money get in his way. So he built this telescope out of farm parts. And so the base of it is from a cream separator. Um, you've got um, the shaft of a Buick um, car that was sitting in um, outside, flywheels from different equipment, um, this tube, galvanized iron, um, like what they use for grain elevators. It might have been a grain elevator, in fact. Um, the, you know, this, this um, faucet handle from outside. Um, later on, he added, he added a Coke can uh, from the 1960s. Uh, you know, he just, he just made it work. And, and because he had that cellar, he, he did the mirror and it turned out really nicely. And so he built this telescope and he started making observations with it. And, and he really liked it. And he got so proficient at it, he started making some really good drawings. And so he thought, you know, he was, he was kind of getting tired of farming, especially because the family lost their crops with a big rain. So he decided, you know, I want to see what the professional astronomers think. They, I may not be able to work in this field, but if nothing else, it's going to be a good hobby. But it, it would be kind of nice to get a job. Um, he might, he had something tentatively lined up to work for a telescope maker. Um, but just about this time, he decides, I'm going to send some of my drawings out uh, to professional astronomers just to see what they think. And so this is, this is um, some of his drawings from 1928 and 29, some um, of Jupiter. He looked at Mars and Jupiter and Saturn and made some nice drawings. So he sent these out to some observatories. And one place he sent them to was Lowell Observatory because again, when he was young, he knew about Percival Lowell and he knew about his ideas about life on Mars. And he knew that Lowell Observatory, even though it wasn't necessarily still active as, as much as it had been, you know, they study planets. So, you know, what do they think about my work? Well, he sent a letter in and he got a very surprising letter back that said, um, we're very intrigued by your drawings. Um, what kind of physical condition were you in? And are you used to hard work? It was kind of unusual questions. Well, it, the timing couldn't have been more exquisite because the director of the observatory at the time was this guy, Vesto Slifer, um, VM Slifer, as he often went by. And VM Slifer uh, was the first person to detect, um, detect um, galaxies that were expanding or the universe expanding. Um, he detected this recessional velocity. And then Hubble um, famously, just 100 years ago last week, um, put together Henrietta Leavitt's observations of Cepheid variables with VM Slifer's um, recessional velocity measurements to come up with the um, expanding universe model. But VM Slifer was the director of the observatory now. And he had been kind of having trouble um, he needed help because the observatory had been almost dormant for 10 years, but finally the will was settled and Slifer and his boss, who was Percival Lowell's brother-in-law, who is now running the observatory said, you know, Uncle Percy was onto something and we have to, we have to recharge the observatory to get it back into the real world. And so we want to, um, we want to recommence Percival Lowell's search for a planet. And so they, had, they started this. Um, they got money to build a new telescope that was designed specifically to take wide angle pictures of the sky, a good survey telescope. This is a picture of it, an astrograph. And this is Will Grundy, one of our scientists who's um, one of the lead scientists on the New Horizons mission. So um, Slifer builds this telescope and now he needs somebody to run it, to take the pictures at night. And he's sending letters around the country to colleagues, asking them if they have any, do you have any students? Do you have any, um, you know, postdocs? Anybody that can help, that can come out here and help us. And he's asking others to see if there's money to support this. And while he's going through all this, he gets this letter from this 23 year old farmer named Clyde Tomba. And the timing couldn't have been better. I'm convinced that. If Tomba had let, sent those letters, you know, a year earlier or later, he probably never would have worked at Lowell Observatory. They would have had somebody else or it would have been too early in the search. 
but the timing was just right. Um, and so that letter that said, what do you think of my drawings led to VM Slifer hiring Clyde Tombaugh. And so these two worlds are coming together, this, this long search, it had been a 25 year search off and on that Percival Lowell had been searching for a planet, he died. Now they're starting to search for it again. And then this young guy, Clyde Tombaugh, who was passionate about the sky. And his dream was to work in astronomy, never thought he could because he didn't have the money. Now he has the chance. So they hire him and he spends his nights taking pictures of the night sky and these plates. Then during the daytime, he puts the pictures on the blink comparator, um, take, you know, the pictures taken a few days apart. And this is what he would do. This is, this is the blink comparator um, flashing very quickly. And you can see essentially the stars are um, pretty much the same. You can tell it's the same field of view. If you look closely though, you see like, look in this area, if you see the arrow, you see dots coming and going. That shows how difficult this was. The, the plates had to be so precisely um, similar, you know, the similar atmospheric conditions, um, similar development of the plates that um, it would be very difficult to, you know, if you have something like this, how do you know if something is a planet or not? You have to stop and measure each one and see if it really is something that's moved. Um, so anyways, this is how he spends his time. Um, during the daytime, he blinks. At nighttime, he takes pictures. And so this is what his life is like um, for the first year or so um, that he's at the observatory. Get to January, and um, he starts searching in the, in the Gemini area of the sky. And this is one of the places where Percival Lowell, in that memoir, thought there might be a planet. Um, but when, when Clyde Tomba started, Gemini was getting really low in the sky. So he took a few early pictures, but then had to wait till the next January to when it was up in the sky again. And so January 21st, um, he, he took a plate um, centered around Delta Geminorum. Um, and you can see from this description, remarks, fuzzy images, it wasn't a very good plate. So two nights later, he did the plate again, had a good plate. And then six nights later, he, he did the repeat plate. So six days apart, he had these pictures. And um, just another night or several nights, he's taking several pictures of the sky. Um, several nights later, repeats that process. And so then during the daytime, he's using the blink comparator, um, analyzing those. Well, we go to February 18th, 1930. And Clyde Tombaugh had been at the observatory for just about a year. And it was a day like many other days. He would walk downtown. He would have his breakfast um, at the Black Cat Cafe. It's now a sushi place, Karma Sushi. Um, and then he would come back up and work on the Blink Comparator for a while. And then he would go to lunch and have and go to the Black Cat. And then he would come back up again and start, you know, looking at this field of dots. So he's doing this. And at about four o'clock in the afternoon, um, he's, he's looking at this pair of plates and he notices there's a nice arrow there now um, um, because he's got these plates. I actually can't see the other one, but you'll see the arrow on there. Um, you can tell if you look at these, you know, most of the dots, most of the stars are the same, but this one over here, it's there in that position, it's not on the other plate. And this was pretty exciting. He had um, he had seen planet suspects before, um, and so but this seemed like a valid thing because the dot was changing the right position um, for the distance of a planet. You know, if it moved a lot, if it if it had moved a lot um, further apart, the further it moved, the closer it was to us. If it moved a lot further, it was probably an asteroid, something a lot closer. They were looking for something that was further in our solar system. And the distance that changed um, kind of supported that. And so he's pretty excited, brings in Vesto Slifer, um, says, I think I find your planet X. And Vesto Slifer says, OK, um, now that we know where to look for this thing, come back tonight and use the big telescope, the 24-inch refractor, and zoom in 
and see if you can determine a disk or if there are moons or anything like that. So Clytombo is now 24 years old. And by the way, don't tell anybody, as Lifer said, because we don't want word getting out and then somebody scoops us on the discovery or on further study, we realize it's not a planet. Don't tell anybody. And so Clyde doesn't. What's he gonna do till it gets dark? So he goes downtown to the Black Hat Cafe, has dinner, um, checks the mail, looks up, it's getting dark and it's cloudy and he can't view. And he's, you know, you imagine 24 years old, he thinks he just discovered a planet. And so he goes to the Orpheum Theater and sees um, a movie, The Virginian with Gary Cooper. And so good trivia question, what movie did he watch the night he discovered Pluto? So he keeps going outside, it's still cloudy. So he can't see, he can't look through the telescope. He has to wait for another night to uh, make confirmation observations through the big telescope. Um, he does. And over the next few weeks, they take more images. And by um, early February, the, the Lowell team decides we've got a planet here. Um, let's, make it, let's make the announcement. So they decided to announce it on March 13th, 1930. And, and March, there's so much great symmetry here. March 13th um, is the date that in 1781, William Herschel discovered Uranus. But March 13th, um, 1930, would have been Percival Lowell's 75th birthday had he lived long enough. So it's a nice little tribute to Percival Lowell announcing it on his birthday. Um, they announced it, you know, New York Times, front page news, ninth planet discovered at edge of solar system, first found in 84 years. Um, this made this made news around the world because it was the first planet discovered in the 20th century, um, the first planet discovered in the United States. And in a time that we were in the depression, that most news was not positive, this was something really exciting. And it got the attention of people around the world. And soon the observatory was inundated with letters and telegrams of congratulation. Um, and then there were a lot of questions. Um, the two big questions, scientists said, what's this orbit? Because we want to know how this thing is moving, um, how long is the year and so on. And another question that everybody wanted to know is what are you going to call it? We want to, you know, we've got a new planet, we need a name for it. And so with these congratulations started coming all these suggestions of names, um, telegrams from around the world, letters, we still have about 250 of these in the archives at Lowell Observatory. Um, the most, probably the most common suggestion um, was Minerva, because Minerva was the goddess of knowledge. And, you know, the search for this planet was largely based on mathematical calculations and figuring out where in the sky to look. Um, Minerva, but Minerva had already been used to name an asteroid, so they couldn't use that. Um, it turns out, a lot of people also suggested the name Pluto because Pluto was the god of the underworld, the most distant cold region, and this planet was distant and cold. Um, so a lot of people suggested that. Um, several people discovered naming it after Charles Lindbergh because he had just flown across the Atlantic a few years before that. Um, it's, it's interesting to look back, in fact, at the suggestions of names because if you didn't know the date, you could piece together probably within a year or two when it happened just by reading the letters because um, they really reflected um, what was happening at the time. Charles Lindbergh was big news. Um, a lot of people suggested peace or the, the um, mythological character Pax for peace because the 1930s were um, proclaimed to be the decade of peace. Um, it started out well, but it didn't end up so well. Um, but but ultimately they decided to go with Pluto. And this girl right here, 11 years old, her name is Venetia Burney. Um, there are a lot of people that suggested Pluto, but hers was the first um, that came in. She was having breakfast in England with her grandfather who knew some astronomers. And she said, you know, I've been learning about astronomy and mythological characters in class. And they should name this planet Pluto because because Pluto had two siblings 
um, Saturn, Uranus and Saturn, I think, that are in the solar system, and also the god of the underworld. And so the grandfather um, contacted his astronomer friend, who then sent a telegram to Lowell Observatory, and that was the first one that came in suggesting Pluto. Within days, there were a lot of other suggestions, but they decided to call it this, um, gave it this symbol, um, a combination of P and L, was her not only the first two letters of Pluto, but also Percival Lowell's initials. So again, a little tribute to Percival Lowell. Um, and so that became its name. And while Venetia Burney didn't technically name it, they gave her credit for first suggesting that name. So it was a nice, a nice way to tie in kids to make it an international thing. Um, and and um, it, you know, is a feel-good story. So so that's a little bit about the discovery of Pluto. There, I, I think it's a fascinating story because there's there's so many unlikely things. Um, and it's such a personal story for for Percival Lowell, who is passionately trying to, to outside of the freeway uphold his family's name. And Clyde Tomba, who didn't have the fam didn't have the money, but he found a way to do astronomy and how they came together, as it were. So I think it's a neat story. And of course. The story since then is fascinating with how Pluto has been reclassified and is Pluto a planet or not, and the reaction to that among the public, which is just amazing. It, it's, you know, it's been years since Pluto is reclassified as a dwarf planet. And, um, and you know, if you talk to planetary scientists, they still call it a planet. Um, astronomers who study galactic things, they're the, they call it a dwarf planet that's not a type of planet. Alan Stern, the head of New Horizons mission that flew to Pluto, he, he's the one that first came up with dwarf planet, but he says it's a type of planet. Um, and in fact, he says it's, there's three, it's kind of the third zone of planets. You have the inner terrestrial planets, the outer gas giants, and then these icy planets. And Pluto is one of many icy planets. So the intrigue about Pluto continues, you know, its name, that is often associated with a Disney character. Um, and, and the Disney character came after Pluto, the name the year later, and it seems pretty, pretty likely that, you know, Walt Disney was so into science, this was a major scientific discovery. So he renamed the dog um, from Rufus to, to um, Pluto. And so it's, a, it's just a really neat story. And there's, a, but there's another aspect to, of it that's kind of interesting. Um, Clyde Tomba, for the rest of his life, he continued using that telescope, that nine inch telescope that he made the drawings. And he had bigger telescopes he used also, um, but this was always a favorite of his. And in fact, in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, um, Smithsonian Institution asked him if he would donate the telescope um, to their collections. And he said, no, I'm still using it. You can't have it. Um, so he continued using it till his death in the, in the 1990s. Um, and then it stayed in, his fa in the family. Um, his widow lived for many years after that. Um, after she passed away, um, the two kids, um, Al and, and um, Annette, um, they then had to start looking on how to um, sell these telescopes because they, they've told me they would have preferred to donate this telescope to Lowell Observatory because it, it's how Clyde Tama got to Lowell in the first place. But the will said sell, every, sell all the telescopes because Clyde Tomba and his wife knew that there would be a lot of bickering in the family. Um, if you give the telescope away, well, why didn't I get the telescope? So they just sell it all, split the money. Um, that's how it happened. And so they finally found an auction house just a couple of years ago and auctioned the telescope off. And here at Lowell Observatory, we knew that it was happening. And our, our philanthropy team reached out to several donors. And a couple of our lead donors said, hey, we'll put some money in as a seed gift. And suddenly we had, I don't know, 150, 200 people that donated. And um, we won the auction and the telescope came back home. And last year we, ded we dedicated it. If you come to the observatory now, it's in our Rotunda Museum. Um, and this is during the dedication last year. 
um, every year we have a festival called I Heart Pluto Festival. And last year, our keynote speaker was astronaut Nicole Stott. So we dedicated it last year. So if you come to Lowell, I, I think it's just beautiful because you can come here and, and see this telescope, which um, is how Clay Tama got here. You can see the telescope he actually used to make the discovery, which is a different one. That telescope is about Pluto. This one's about the man. This one's about his creativity and inventiveness to make a telescope. Um, and so um, we feature it in our IR Pluto Festival. We opened it last year. And as a final picture, I think my last one here to, to show how important that was, um, every year for our festival, we have a local brewing company, Mother Road Brewing Company, that celebrates the, the heritage of Route 66. They make a special brew for us every for every every February for our IHAR Pluto Festival. And they love this concept that Clyde Tamba built a storm cellar um, so he could have still air. And so this is the beer they made, still air, uh, passion fruit ale, because Clyde Tamba was so passionate. So they use passion fruit. And so it's a, it's just, there's something about Pluto because of all these connections is it goes beyond the science. There's a cultural side of Pluto um, that makes it so fascinating. Um, so, you know, I could, I could gush about this all night because I just think it's so fascinating, all these different side stories with Pluto. Um, but that's, that's a little bit about his discovery. Um, and, you know, the two people that really made it happen, Percival Lowell, um, Clyde Tombaugh, and how their worlds kind of came together in one with the discovery of Pluto. So I'll stop talking because otherwise I'm going to be talking until the moon starts passing in front of the sun. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and say thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing and then I can um, go to the chat if anybody has any questions. I'm glad to take those either verbally or in the chat or whatever. And I'll let, let Reza, you know, monitor. Yeah, sure. Like. Thank you very much, Kevin, for a fascinating talk about the history of this uh, discovery. Thank you very much. That was great. So Thank let you. me uh, let me know every uh, let me acknowledge everybody that uh, uh, the floor is now open for questions that you might have. Um, you could use the Q and A section on the Zoom, and if you're in person. Uh, Let's start with the in-person audience. Are there any questions? Okay. Uh, I'm, can you hear me, Reza? Yes. Go ahead, Doc. Okay. First of all, there are some people here who met uh, Clyde Tombo. If you've met Clyde Tombo, can you raise your hand? One, two, three, four, and five. Helen up there. Helen had dinner with him at, at one point. Oh, that's um, great. And how many people have been to Lowell Observatory? Yeah, almost most of the people here have been to Lowell Observatory. And there's some other things, but having met Cl Clyde Tombaugh, oh, I also need to say that the uh, New Horizons mission, the, the um, PI was here before and after the encounter of Pluto and gave a program at uh, OCA. Yeah, Ellen Stern is a really great speaker. And I, you know, something about that mission that that is just gives me chills still, there's two things about it. Um, I was in Mission Control in 2015 when we were getting the images back from New Horizons because we had we had Will Grundy, the little scientist. So they had this big um, event in the auditorium at Mission Control in um, Maryland, and the Tombaugh family was there, the kids. And I was sitting next to the Tombaugh's when they showed the that first image of the heart shape, and when they announced this heart shape, we're going to call it. Tomba Regio, and it was it was so neat to be sitting with the Tombas when their dad was recognized like that. Um, so that was really touching. The day before that, it was even more special because um, you you probably know many of you know that um, before they launched the flight, they talked to the Tomba family because Clyde had passed away a few years before, and they got a vial, a little container of some of his ashes. And put it on board. And so when when New Horizons was flying out there, they knew precisely when it was going to be passing by Pluto and taking all those pictures. And, and so 
we were all gathered in the big auditorium in the big room. Everybody's waving the American flags. And when when it went by, you know, the the clock counted down and everybody's cheering and waving the flag. But then there's there's the Tom boss. And for them, it was different because dad just got to Pluto. He made it to Pluto. And it, it was just a touching moment that still gives me chills um, to be in the middle of all that in the celebration. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's see if there's any questions in the hall tonight. Anybody want to ask a question? Looking around. No questions here in uh, the hall. Back to you, Rosie. Okay, Rosa. sure. We'll get back to the hall. Uh, we have some questions online, Kevin. Um, can you tell us a bit more about Clyde and the World War II? Uh, yeah, Clyde, um, he he worked at Lowell. You know, he discovered a planet, and now he could go to college. <laughs> he got a free ride to go to University of Kansas. He was their favorite son, and so he, he went to Kansas. Um, and in fact, there's a story that he went into his Astronomy 101 class, and the professor looked at the book and said, Clyde Tomba, get out of here. <laughs> you discover a planet. You've passed this class. Um, but he, So he went there. Um, and and then he ended up coming back to Lowell, uh, was here for several years, and then he ends up in New Mexico where he was um, look he was working at White Sands, and this is in the mid '40s um, for several years before he went to New Mexico State University. So right kind of toward the end of World War II, um, somewhere around that time is when he when he. Um, went to White Sands or maybe a couple of years after that, but he um, he then was looking, tracking or looking for artificial satellites. But then at White Sands, um, he was developing these special um, kind of like telescope observing stands um, to observe the V2 rockets they were testing there. The, the rockets that we had confiscated from the Germans, they were setting them off and testing them and he developed techniques um, for observing them through telescopes. Um, so he had a really interesting evolution in his career. He was always, he remained interested in astronomy and, and taught astronomy um, in New Mexico State for years. Um, but but that work in White Sands was pretty interesting. Thank you. And uh, here's another question. Uh, do you think we need another Clyde Tomba to find the new ninth planet out in the Kuiper Belt or the Oort Cloud? <laughs> you know, maybe so. It's you know, when, when Clyde Tombo was doing that work, he was he was the right person for the job. And there's there's some irony to it because because first of all, they were looking for a needle in a haystack, and the way he was doing is systematically looking at dots. In looking for one to change, it required somebody that had attention to detail, that was patient. In today's world, you couldn't be on your phone. Um, you had to be focused. Um, and he was the right person for the job. He And I think, again, growing up on the farm and the repetition of farm work, and you just go out there and row after row, you're you know cultivating or whatever. I think there's something to be said for that, that trained him to be the right person for the job. Um, there is one astronomer that came and visited and said, young man, you're wasting your time. We've discovered all the planets in our solar system, um, which is, you know, kind of a small minded mindset. But what's ironic about the whole thing is he did discover the planet um, within very, very close to where Percival Lowell thought a planet would be. Um, but it wasn't Percival Lowell's planet X because Lowell's calculations were based on an assumed mass of Uranus and Neptune, but we didn't have accurate estimates. It wasn't until um, we were able to get spacecraft up there that they could really get accurate estimates and, and realize that, you know, um, Clyde Tombo was looking for a planet this big. He found a planet this big. And, and today we know that um, the, the calculations, first of all, those calculations were, were right on, but the estimates of the planet size were off. If he knew the actual size of the planets, there, there weren't any perturbations um, that was accounted for if you knew its actual mass. 
And so first of all, Lowell's Planet X doesn't exist, but they Claytumba found a planet real close to where he thought it should be. It's it's just so unlikely. Um, Pluto, even even if there, those perturbations were real, Pluto's not nearly big enough, doesn't have enough mass to account to account for those, even if they were real. So they just because he systematically searched the sky, you know, if you look, if you look, you're gonna find something. <laughs> and because nobody had done it systematically like that, he discovered this planet within a year. And then he spent another 14 years doing the same thing, covering more than 80% of the sky, didn't find any other planets, discovered a lot of other things, but you know, it's it's just so unlikely. So, you know, that tenacity, that dedication, um, yeah, we could say he didn't find Lowell's planet, but he did find a planet because of that tenacity. If it, if Clyde Tomba hadn't discovered Pluto, um, I mean, there's a good chance it wouldn't have been discovered till, I don't know, the 1980s or 90s, um, if then. Um, so the idea that we need another Clyde Tomba, I like that idea. Somebody that is, you know, you gotta be careful with the assumptions. Well, we must've found all the planets by now. You know, have we? Um, I don't know, but getting getting the right person that that says maybe maybe there are let's look let's look systematically. I think it's I think it's intriguing to think about that. Thank you, thank you. And uh, somebody wants to know when will the 2024 I Love Pluto Festival be? <laughs> oh, well, technically, it's the I Heart Pluto Festival. Uh, but but it's all the same thing. So it's always centered around um, Pluto discovery date, which is February 18th, and also the um, President's weekend. And so this year it's February 17th, 18th, and 19th. So Friday, Saturday, or Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. And it actually kicks off on Friday. A pre-event is the Pluto pub crawl. Um, you know, you can create anything, you know, the symbol of Pluto with the P and L. Um, we, there are a bunch of bars in town that if you look at a map, um, it's a P and an L, their alignment. I mean, you can kind of map them out in that. So so we do this Pluto pub crawl. And then um, our, our keynote event is on Saturday the 17th. And our keynote speaker this year is, um, her name is Diana Gabaldon. And some of you may recognize her name. She is um, the great granddaughter of Stanley Sykes, who built the telescope used to discover Pluto, um, built the dome here. Um, she also happens to be the author of the Outlander series of books and TV show. Um, and so she's this best-selling author who has this connection to Lowell Observatory. So she's going to be our keynote speaker and um, the Tumba family will be there and we'll have another Pluto beer, um, probably themed around Stanley Sykes or instrument making or something like that. And and these IHAR Pluto festivals are kind of, we do them every year, but it's kind of leading up to the centennial of Pluto's discovery in 2030. And that'll be a, a pretty big bash. Great, looking forward to that. Thank you. So uh, let's turn to the audience uh, in person. Uh, any questions there? Nope, pretty uh, pretty happy. Okay, great. So we have another question online. Uh, can you tell us more about uh, the tools and the methods that Tamba used to make his telescope? Right. So he he would he would he ordered the glass. Um, so there were some some places where you could order glass you know, places that made telescopes or you could get the supplies from. So he, he learned about telescope making by um, looking at some magazines like Popular Astronomy and those kind of magazines that um, he found instructions on how to make telescopes. And then he, you know, then he kept experimenting. Um, but he would, he would use standard uh, materials. You use the cloth um, and, and grit um, to, to grind the mirror and then finer grit. Um, and then, so, you know, kind of standard, some of the stuff that I, probably some of the people in this room have used to make your own mirrors. Um, it, was all, it was all pretty standard stuff. Now the telescopes on the other hand, you know, to hold the mirror, that's when he just, 
you know, he went around the farm and used whatever he could. There's one one of his telescopes he made. Um, I think this the nine inch one is probably the most famous one because it's got all these farm parts on it. But another one he made, he got the base of a push lawnmower and took the motor off and mounted a telescope on top of it so he could roll it in and out of the garage and he called it the grazer gazer. Um, and he had that telescope through the end of his life also. And supposedly it worked well. It was certainly easy to move in and out of the garage. Great, thank you. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about the Pluto itself. Uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, physical properties and stuff that make the heart of the Pluto? No, I can't. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm not really familiar with the with the geology of it too much. Um, you know, there's when they when they fi- got the images back, um, the the astronomers weren't sure what to expect. There were a lot of predictions on what it would look like, but nobody had any idea that there would be this big feature like this heart-shaped fixture and these these mountains of of ice and um you know the, there's a lot, so much geology geologic activity you know it it kind of i think um, peppered up the discussion of is pluto a planet or not because it has geologic activity um these mountains you know periodically has an atmosphere um it's got several moons going around it but it's it's kind of up for debate. So the, the specific, yeah, the specific um, geology and composition, um, I won't comment on because I I'm not very expert on that stuff. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me do a last call for any questions uh, online or in person. Uh, Okay, it looks generally, like got... generally in OCA, we consider it a planet. <laughs> well, you can come and visit Lowell then. <laughs> you know, to me, I, I think the whole conversation of is, is it a planet or not, to me, it, it's a good draw to talk about science and astronomy um, because we have a lot of people that come here. That's one of the first things so many people want to talk about. Um, and I think it's fascinating because in some ways it shows how science is done. You know, when Pluto was discovered, it was a dot. And when New Horizons went by, it went from a dot to a world. Um, and so we learned so much more about it and we refine our understanding of it. And that's how science is done. You know, you discover a beetle and name it a new species and then find out that, oh, this is like another beetle that's already known. And then you, you know, change its name. You know. We're always changing our understanding of science as a progress report based on the most current information we have. This is the best idea we have. So that's how science works. You reevaluate. Maybe we should call it this or call it that. But on the other hand, it's also how science doesn't work. Um, scientists don't sit in a room and vote uh, on what to do, whether it's to call it something. It's, it's sort of, you know, acclimation through scientific papers and talks and not everybody agrees, but there's kind of a consensus that's built, but it's, it's, it's never been a vote. It's just, it's bizarre. So I think, it, I think it's, to me, again, it's whatever side you're on, um, I think it's a fascinating story. And, and to be able to visit where it all happened, like I, my office for several years was Clyde Tombaugh's office. And so to be able to, you know, kind of live in that aura, it's like Mount Wilson Observatory where Hubble was or where Einstein visited, or, you know, every historic observatory especially has some of those places like that, that you can feel the ghosts of past scientists there. Um, So, you know, it's kind of neat to visit places like that. And in fact, you know, I put this out, if if any of you, you know, are interested in, in visiting the observatory, you know, either as a group or individually, um, let me know. I'm Kevin at Lowell.edu, and I'd be glad to show you around. It's, you know, we, it's a great facility. You know, amateur astronomers especially, it's, it's kind of a mecca. It's one of those mecca places like Lick, Mount Wilson, Palomar, you know, some of those places. And so, I, you know, let me know. I'd be glad to show you around.
Thank you very much for this personal invitation. I'm sure a lot of us will take advantage of this. And uh, by the way, since you uh, mentioned that uh, tomorrow you're hosting a live stream, uh, will the link be on the Lobel website uh, directly, easy yeah. to find? Yep, it's on the Lobel website. And you can also just go to YouTube and search for Lobel Observatory. And I think it's probably the first thing that comes up. Yes, sure. Great. Thank you very much. So we have uh, reached the end of our uh, meeting. Kevin, again, thank you very much. Much, much appreciated. Um, and uh, before I end the meeting, let me remind people of two things. First of all, uh, the elections for the uh, OCA Board of Directors. Uh, we always welcome uh, newcomers and uh, new people to nominate themselves. Uh, second, uh, you could always check our website, ocastronomers.org, for all the events and uh, activities that are going on. Uh, with this, I thank everybody for joining us and wish you all great times ahead and happy and enjoy uh, seeing the eclipse tomorrow. Bye-bye.